Yep. All right, great. Let us pray. O oh Lord, your word is powerful, and so we ask that you speak the word to us to take away our sin and make us new. Give us faith to trust in your word, uh, that we may take comfort from it and live freely as your children. Uh, watch over our fellow students who are not with us tonight, uh, and bless uh, us all in our preparations for Christmas, that the holiday may truly uh, be merry for us. Uh, keep safe all who travel. Uh, bless our gatherings with peace. Uh, may the good news of the birth of your Son uh, find its way to our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Uh, before we dive into this lesson, we have to review what we said last week. Uh, Jordan, you can do this for us since you just memorized it. <laughs> what benefits does God give in baptism? Can you say it out loud without looking? Uh, you need a two. Um, so in baptism, God... Gives. gives everlasting salvation to all who believe. All who, yeah, to all who believe what he has promised. Very good. I'm curious, could you all say that now? No. You just did it a week ago. See, just see how well you could stumble your way through it. So, what benefits does God give in baptism? In baptism, God forgives sin, delivers from death and the devil, and gives everlasting salvation to all who believe what he has promised. Now, <laughs> Those are some very big benefits. Um, this is not small potatoes. Uh, God is talking about enormous gifts uh, in, in baptism, which you yourself have received uh, as a baptized Christian. Uh, so this question, this next question is a very good one. Uh, how can water do such great things? Uh, if, if baptism does all this, how can water accomplish that? Uh, here's a question for you. Uh, where do we get the water for baptisms at our church? When we have a baptism here. I always wonder. Yeah, where, do, where does the water come from? Like that big square thing that has like the cap over the thing with the water. Yeah, the font. That's right. So it's in the font. Yeah, we call it the font that has that dish of water inside. And the big square thing that surrounds it. That's the font. But where does that water come from? Isn't it just tap water? It is. It's just tap water. It comes from the, the sink. Uh, the sink in the kitchen. Somebody fills up a pitcher of water, pours it into the font. Uh, so this this is not uh, unusual or, or sort of special water. I, I'll tell you. In fact, I can even give you uh, the chemical compound of this water. It is H2O. Thank you. Yep. Um, it is H2O. The same kind of water you use that you drink, uh, that you use to brush your teeth, the kind used to wash your hands and cook with. It's normal water. So then, how can baptism do all this if it's just ordinary H2O? Well, this is the catechism's question for tonight. How can water do such great things? Well, it is not water that does these things, but God's Word with the water and our trust in this Word. All right, so let's say this because you, you either just were quizzed on it or will be very soon. Uh, how can water do such great things? It is not water that does these things, but God's word with the water and our trust in this word. Let's say it again. It is not water that does these things, but God's word with the water and our trust in this word. And then the, the rest of it, just kind of uh, flesh this out. Water by itself is only water. But with the word of God, it is a life-giving water, which by grace gives the new birth through the Holy Spirit. And so there we've got a, a few things that are all coming together in baptism. And that, that, the, the key one right uh, that it's said right up front is the Word of God. Uh, that like we said that first week, a sacrament is two things together. What were the two things? God's Word yep. and a physical thing. Yep, God's Word and a physical thing. That's right. Um, so, uh, this is baptism. H2O and the Word of God. Also notice in there uh, that it mentions our trust in this word, faith. Uh, that is, it's faith that receives this promise, this word of God. And it also mentions somebody else who is there in baptism. Oh, St. Paul. No? Oh. Which by grace gives the new birth through Holy Spirit. the Holy Spirit. 
Yes. The Holy Spirit is present in baptism. Right? This was the this was the promise that John the Baptist made. He said, I just baptized with water. All I got, John said, is H2O. But he said, Jesus, the one who's coming, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Uh, and so uh, when Jesus, when you are baptized in Jesus' name, it is water, truly indeed. Plain, ordinary water. Good old H2O. But it is also with, accompanied with the Word of God. That is, Jesus has told us to do this, and He's made promises for us that when we are baptized, we receive all these benefits. By faith, by trust, we receive these promises. And the Holy Spirit is also there in the sacrament to accomplish all this, to make you new, uh, to put to death the old sinner, to raise up a new you. Uh, so, uh, big, big benefits, and it happens because it's ain't just H2O. Uh, God's Word has a lot of power. Now, if you think about it, there are a lot of words that don't often have that much power. If I say, uh, right now in Beijing, it is 57 degrees. Do you care? No. Do you care, Candace? No. Uh, if I say, uh, uh, tomorrow, uh, uh, tomorrow, let's see, what, what, what else could I say? Uh, tomorrow, uh, we're going to have, uh, uh, tomorrow it's going to be uh, my... Uh, it's going to be my aunt's birthday. My grandpa's birthday. Oh, Jordan kind of cares. She's got a, a family connection. <laughs> Someone else has a similar birthday. Um, but generally, you guys just kind of like, eh? Okay. Yeah, right. Hygiene. No, yeah, and hygiene. Yeah, we got to get that in there. Hygiene. Um, so th there's all kinds of words I could share with you that just don't matter that much, that don't excite you. Uh, you know, or if we just pass each other in the hallway, they're like, hey, what's up? What's up? You just keep on going, right? But now, what if, what if I, I walked by in the hallway and I said, um, I'm going to beat your face in. Oh, it's now, would that, would that get your attention a little more? Yeah. Yeah? Uh, or what if, what if, let's say this, uh, let's say there's a really cute boy you like, all right? And, uh, or, or a really cute girl. And, and uh, after class, she's walking or he's walking down the hallway and says, hey, here's my phone number. Now, would that get your attention? Is that a little more interesting than the weather report from Beijing? Yeah. Um, <laughs> we're not going to talk about the details of Matt's love life, okay? Um, but again, uh, there are some words that, that grab hold of us a little bit more than others that, that make a difference. God's word is that kind of word. It has power. Um, open up your Bibles to Jeremiah. I need a little. Go to Jeremiah twenty-three. Old Testament, uh, but it's it's after the Psalms. Remember, the Psalms are in the middle. Uh, and soon after that, we get the prophets like Isaiah. He's the big one, the first prophet in the Bible. And then Jeremiah after that. So look for Psalms. Soon after that, you'll get Isaiah, then Jeremiah. Jeremiah 23. Jeremiah 23. And we're going to look at verse 29. I read it. Yeah, Bennett, why don't you start at verse 28, in fact. Okay. Let the prophet who has a dream tell his dream, but let the one who has my word speak it faithfully. For what has straw to do with grain, declares the Lord. Is not my word like fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks a rock in pieces. Good, pause there. What is straw in common with wheat or grain? In other words, if you know farming, you know there are different things that grow out of field. Some you want, some you don't. Some are worth something, grain, wheat. Some you just, you know, throw away or just kind of use, you know. You can feed you. Yeah, you can, or line the, the, the goat pen with it. I mean, you know, there's some stuff that, that's important, some stuff you can just kind of toss aside. God's word, he says, is something precious, like wheat. Um, and so then he says, God knows on your works, your God's word is like 
In Jeremiah 23, 29, well, he says, verse 29, Is not my word like fire, says the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks a rock in pieces? So I want you to not, not just, I don't just want you to, to write this. I want you to, to draw it. Uh, fire. He says his word is like fire and like a hammer. His word is like fire and a hammer. Good. Jack hammer's good. This is what we're talking about. God says, isn't my word like fire? Like a hammer that breaks a rock in pieces? Uh, you got a jackhammer? All right. Fire uh, does something. If, if, a fi if your curtains at home catch on fire, you run. I mean, you, you take care of that fast. At the same time, you can use fire. I mean, you use it to cook your food. I mean, fire does stuff. It changes things. Same thing with a hammer that breaks rocks. Uh, it, it has an effect on you. Uh, go to Isaiah. That's the next one on your worksheet there. Isaiah 55. That's actually the first page I get to. Isaiah what? Is it? Cool. 55. Isaiah is the previous book. Right before Jeremiah. That book sucks Well, maybe we should explain that we had to do this once before. Today is pajama day. In case anybody is curious, uh, if my if my uh, mother-in-law or any of our absent students are watching this and confused, it's pajama day. And Bennett just got some brand new pajamas for Christmas. Isn't that nice, folks? Um, and the new wallet. And uh, let's see. Uh, oh, we got Becca's wearing her uh, her lizard pajamas or crocodile pajamas. Yep. Becca, put your hood up. Yeah. Jordan, are you wearing pajamas? These are my pajamas. Those are your pajamas? All right. And, uh, Amber, yeah, Amber's got her pajamas. That's right. Good. Amber, am I on this thing? I got you. Bennett, you got it? All right, great. Um, Isaiah 55, 10 to 11. Who got, who got that one? No, somebody else now. I know you do. Who else would like to read? Go for it. Uh, Becca. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Chapter 55, verse 10 and 11. 55? 55. Chapter 55, verse 10 and 11. Like the rain and the snow one? Yeah. yeah. Oh. Okay. As rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not retain that without watering the earth and making a bud flourish, flourish. So that it yields <laughs> sour seed, no? So that it yields seed for the sower. sower mm -hmm. And bread for the eater. The sower is the one who, who sows the seed and who like spreads the seed in the ground. Good, now read verse 11. I have to read 11 too. Yeah. I'll read 11. I said 10 to 11. So, it is my word that goes out from my mouth. All right, good. God says when rain and snow come to the earth, uh, they don't just, it says, it says they don't uh, uh, return until they've watered it. Um, it they, they, again, they accomplish something. Uh, God sends rain and snow on the earth, and then they water the ground so that it causes plants to grow. Uh, they don't just fall and then just you know, disappear into oblivion. I mean, the rain soaks the earth. It causes plants to grow. Uh, so things sprout up so that we get, uh, so we get uh, uh, seeds and bread, it says. Uh, and God says, my word is like that. When he speaks, it doesn't just go out into nothing and then just disappear. When he speaks, he has a purpose for it. And it's going to accomplish the thing that he wants. Uh, this is such a great line that in verse 11, his word, it says, it will not return to me empty. That is when God says, I forgive your sin. That's not just going to bounce around on your eardrum and then go into nothing and then come back to God. He speaks it like rain hitting the earth so that it soaks in and does something. Yes, Ben? So, I don't get how something like so swampy you know, to like something huge like a tree. Yeah, this is one of the great miracles of God. It's, more, it's a daily miracle. Yeah, that his that seeds uh, will sprout and grow into enormous plants and trees. 
And then again, he says that his word has the same kind of power. Oh yeah, thank you. <laughs> there we go. He says his word has the same kind of power. So now on your worksheet here, I want you to write this in the Isaiah box. I want you to, to draw some drops of rain, and you can draw some six-sided snowflakes. Why are there six? Well, because snowflakes have six sides. Are you serious? I thought they were all different. Every snowflake is different? Yep, but they've all got six sides. How is that possible? What if they're like blocks? It's possible because that's how they form. Because the water droplets in the air that turn into snowflakes are six-sided. So they, when they coalesce into snowflakes, they but form six-sided shapes. They can only form six-sided shapes. Can I make one of eight sides? <laughs> what? Too much science? <laughs> yeah. Well, that one has 10. Get enough of that at school. I know. Wait, what? I don't like snow. What? Except for cross country skiing. We did oh, that. That was so that much was fun. fun. <laughs> I told my mom she was doing it. And look at this this line below it. It says, because God's word blank. So, God's word is like hammer, fire, rain, snow, because God's word accomplishes. Well, let me, let me give you a better word for this. God, because God's word has power and changes things. Because God's word has power and changes things. And so when God uh, baptizes you, again, this, it was the pastor doing the pouring of the water and the speaking, but this, it was God who told us to do this and made promises about it. And the promises are big promises. Like we studied last week in baptism, God forgives sin, delivers from death and the devil, and gives everlasting salvation to all who believe what He has promised. Well, how can water do that? Water can't. But when God makes a promise about baptism, when He attaches His Word to the water, it will accomplish what He wants. Now, God's Word has this kind of power. Uh, we've looked at these examples before in the Bible. How did God create the world? Uh, the world, he spoke, and it happened. God, the, the world, it was, there was nothing. There was just darkness, nothing, emptiness. And God said, let there be light, and? Light. Yeah, there was light. Uh, or, or Jesus uh, was on the storm with his disciples. The boat is, uh, is, is rocking back and forth. They're all afraid. Big storm, and Jesus says, peace, be still. And the storm calms. Yep, he said, peace be still. And the, car, the storm just whoosh, was calm. Uh, or the, the, the great, uh, his, his great moment with Lazarus. His friend Lazarus has died. Uh, and he goes to the grave to visit his, his dead friend. And he tells him to move the stone away from the grave. Prays to his father. And he says, he looks into the grave and says, Lazarus, come out. What happens? Lazarus. Well, of course, yeah. Lazarus rises from the dead, uh, and, the, and he's wrapped up like a mummy, and Jesus says, well, unbind him, let him go, he's alive. I mean, Jesus' word has this kind of power, that when he says something, it goes, it happens. And so when you were baptized, this was his word. Again, it was the pastor maybe speaking, but this was God's word. It was God who commanded this, he made promises about it, and so we know that uh, uh, this is Jesus truly speaking now when you're baptized to accomplish all this for you. All the things He has promised to forgive your sins, to make you His disciple, to give you new life. Uh, this is how one can do such great things. And now take out your catechism, because I want to look at this, this verse from Titus 3, uh, briefly. Page 24. This is just one, one more example now of the promise of baptism, the word that goes with baptism, what God promises to do for you when you're baptized. Uh, so St. Paul says this in Titus 3. This is his letter uh, to Titus, the third chapter. Uh, and Paul says that Jesus saved us in virtue of his own mercy by the washing, this is what he calls baptism, by the washing of regeneration and renewal in the Holy Spirit. What is regeneration? There isn't a science term for you. You like science so much. What's regeneration? I have no clue. Yes, you do. You do have a clue. Because it goes like this. Like, are you doing something? Uh, here, uh, here is a, 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 
a salamander. Oh, is oh, it like, like reprodu reproduction? Skin. And there's his tail, right? Uh, you uh, regenerate. You cut off that oh. salamander's tail. <laughs> it grows again. We call that regeneration. That yeah. Like a um, I know it's a terrible drawing. Or a starfish. Same thing. Starfish have this. Yeah, you, you can cut off a starfish's arm, its arms, it grows Ooh. back. Um, you guys actually, we humans have this maybe to a lesser extent. You um, can't grow your nails. No, what you can do, uh, when at one point in your life your tooth, your baby teeth will fall out and new ones grow back. That's also a kind of regeneration. Um, and this is what Paul says your baptism is. It is a washing of regeneration. That in baptism, what gets cut off is the old you. I mean, your old relationship to sin, death, and the devil, that gets cut off. Uh, and what grows back is not just more of the same, like you know, like it used to be, but a new, a new you, uh, a new life in Christ. I know it's a terrible drawing, um, uh, but this is this is your baptism, this rebirth, a new you. Yes, Ben. If you like just cut up. Get off like the very wow. tip of your finger. You can it can regenerate. Can it? That happens to my social teacher, or really? geography teacher. Huh. Wait, did we learn this in science or something? Social. 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 Social which he poured out upon us richly, God poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that we might be justified by his grace and become heirs in hope of eternal life. And so this is, again, the gift of your baptism. He did all this so that we would be, it says, justified by his grace. Now, there's a good word. I want you to understand what this word means, to say that in baptism, we are justified by his grace. And now, what is it? Yeah, this is the one that you forgot. That's all right. We'll do it now. What does justified mean if somebody is justified? Right. It's like the word that they use in like judge. Yeah, but it sounds like a courtroom. Yeah. yeah. Well, like, here's an example. If you uh, tell your mom and dad, I'm going to be home uh, by 10 o'clock, I'm going to go to the game, my friends and I will go out to DQ afterwards, then we'll be home by 10. Let's say you come home at midnight. And you didn't text, you didn't call, you're in trouble. And what they're going to say is, where were you? And what you've got to do right now is justify yourself. <laughs> you've got to explain what you did, why you were late, why you didn't call. Now what you're doing is justifying yourself. Now notice what happens now in baptism. God does not want you to justify yourself. Rather, you are justified as a gift. This is what grace is. Grace is God's undeserved love for us. And so in baptism, he doesn't say, okay, tell me what you did wrong and, and explain it. He says, yeah, I sure you bet you've done a whole lot wrong, but now I'm just wiping that away. It's all good between us. You don't have to give me excuses. I just forgive it all. This is your baptism. When he is done, you are justified. And if you stand before him and try to make excuses, he'll say, don't want to hear it. You're justified because of Christ. Rebecca. Um, but it says here that we might be justified. Right? So that we might be justified. No, in this case, this is, um, to, it's already using our uh, school subject of grammar. Uh, in, this, in this case, the grammar here is not saying that maybe it'll happen, maybe it won't happen. But he has done this so that we might be justified. The emphasis is not on the might, like it's unsure. Because, uh, in fact, notice what it says at the very, the very last line of this passage. The saying is, sure. sure, yeah, right. So this is not, maybe we'll be justified, but he's done this so that we might be justified. Or you can say it this way, so that we would be justified. Is why Christ has done this for us. To die on the cross and then give us baptism to pour the benefits of his cross upon us. Yes, Candace? I have a question. Great. A story. Great. I'll take two. Fine. Okay, so anyway. <laughs> so a question. Um, yeah. At other... My friends church, they do confessions. Go up and then I say their confessions of the month. Yeah, probably a, a Roman Catholic church. Yeah, something yeah. like that. Mm -hmm. And they do that. And I, is that kind of like justifying? Well, uh, no. Uh, it depends. If you if you go into confession and say, okay, I did this thing wrong. I, I was I was.
two hours late past my curfew. But this is what happened. This is what happened. This is what happened. You know, this is why it happened. Then you're justifying yourself. If you go to that confession and say, I was two hours late for my curfew. I messed up. I'm sorry. That's not justifying yourself. That's waiting for Christ to justify you. Okay, and then, so, um, okay, so there's, like, at the San Francisco Church, they do, like, they kind of do justifying, but their pastor does it for them, so their yeah. pastor will, write, like, write how they've been in class, mm -hmm. and then they'll give it to their parents. Like, yeah. yeah, I mean, there, there are a couple things that might happen in church. Uh, on one on one hand, I mean, if, if I as your teacher, if I write and note your parents saying your kid was acting up in class or not doing their work, yeah, then you may have to justify yourself. Then we are not dealing with we are not dealing with the grace of God. We are dealing with God's law, which says respect your your parents, your teachers, your pastor, so that you can learn something. Okay, uh, so we will use the law to get your attention so that you can learn. But now, we'll operate in a different way. When you come to me as your pastor, or this happens on Sunday, uh, in the confession and forgiveness, we say we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. All right. And now, I'm not justifying myself. I am saying, God, I blew it. Now what I'm saying is I need your grace to justify me so that I'm not just left making excuses and promising to get better all the time, but that I actually receive justification so that I, I, I am forgiven, so that things are made right between me and God. Not because of my excuses, but because of what he has done for me in the cross and because of my baptism. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Confession is very simple. You come to a pastor, you say, I've sinned. You can tell the things that are on your mind that are bothering you. And then the pastor says, I forgive you in Jesus' name. You tell that to your pastor? You can. What kind of stuff do people say? Whatever you want to get off your chest. And a pastor's job is not to tell other people about that uh, or to, um, to hold it over you. A pastor's job is to hear that uh, and try to... to uh, help you say, uh, I, this is what I did wrong, and I'm sure we can talk about ways of not doing that again. Let's try to get you out of these kind of patterns of behavior. But finally, the, the whole goal of this is that your pastor can give you the forgiveness of Christ and say, I have heard you confess, I, I'm, I'm, these things are, are bothering you, let me tell you now what Christ has done. He has taken that sin from you, and it's no longer yours. That's the point of confession. But they do this, they say it like face to face? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because again, sometimes it's sometimes it is very helpful to, to speak things to somebody. And in fact, that's why you have a pastor, is that you know there's somebody you can trust, so that when you need to, get, again, get something off of your mind, off your chest, you know who you can talk to. And if, you're, if you don't feel like you can talk to anyone else, you can always talk to your pastor, whose job is not to make you feel bad about that, but rather to give you Christ's forgiveness. Bennett. Oh. Has I ever come to you before? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. It's a part of the job. It was. And guess what? Actually, this brings our class period to an end because for Christmas, uh, the Christmas services, you guys are accolading. We've been talking about this. Uh, and we're going to go to the sanctuary right now so I can give you some instruction about how to accolade.